So um, I'm a computer hacker, but I work in a lab called Intellectual Ventures. I'm going to talk a little bit about both. This is a hotel room, not unlike the one I'm staying in. Boy, this, uh, can I drag this thing over here? It just taught me when something's going to unplug. <laughs> All right, there we go. All right, so I'm staying in a room like this for a computer hacker. This is a pretty boring place to hang out, except to find something to entertain myself. That TV is, uh, uh, mine's probably, oh, it might work. I don't know if it works. I'll try it. So um, that TV is not like the TV in your home. That TV is a node on a network, right? So if I, uh, this doesn't actually work. Um, plug in a little USB infrared transceiver to my computer. Now I can send the codes that the TV is able to respond to, but the remote in the room doesn't know how to send, right? What's the point of that? Well, I can watch movies for free. Okay, good. I'll um, big deal. Keep going. Um, you know, can play games. Whatever. Keep going. But I can not only do this for my TV in my room, I can do it for your TV in your room. So I control whether you're watching Disney or porn tonight. Right? I can watch you check out if there's one of these registration things in the room, put in your credit card number, stuff like that. Uh, I can watch you surf the web if it has like web surfing on the TV. Keep going. Are you going to stand here or move around? Because you might as well press the button. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move around and, and stand here. Well, I was trying to stay out of the way. Uh, okay, just keep going. So this is, you know, crap we saw. Oh, this is a good one. Funds transfer. This is just watching what people do in their hotel room. This is good. Really big funds transfers. <sighs> I don't know. You never know what people might do in their hotel room on the TV. All right, let's get out of here. Uh, psh, I don't know. Try looking it up on the inner tube. <laughs> okay, so I worked on a bunch of um, sort of crazy hacking projects. Uh, this one in particular is notorious. It's a robot we built called the HackerBot, which can drive around and find Wi-Fi users, drive up to them, and then show them their passwords on the screen, which is, you know, what we thought was cool. We're going to skip this slide because we don't have a lot of time. Oh, this is a good one. Anybody recognize this guy? <laughs> um, I've shown this slide in 47 countries, but um, I've never actually had Sammy in the audience before. <laughs> so this guy, oh, back up and, and we're going to talk about Sammy a second. So Sammy wanted to meet chicks on MySpace. Any MySpace users here? Okay, well, it used to be popular. It's kind of like Facebook. Um, but if you have a MySpace page, the way people tell that you're cool is because you have lots of friends. Well, Sammy didn't have any friends. He's a computer nerd. So um, to fix that, he wrote a little bit of code, JavaScript code, that he put on his page so that whenever you just look at his page, it would just automatically add you as Sammy's friend. And it would skip that whole, are Sammy really your friend part of things. But it was a little better than that, because it would also just copy the code onto your page so that whenever anybody looked at your page, it would add them as Sammy's friend, too. <laughs> so in under 24 hours, Sammy had over a million friends on MySpace. And we're happy to have him back after three years probation where he wasn't allowed to use a, use a computer. Um, but uh, I think he spent the time on probation working out. He looks pretty good, and he can, he can get chicks the old-fashioned way now. So, so uh, come find Sammy White here. Even better, another buddy of ours, Christopher Abad, also wanted to meet chicks on MySpace, but was having spotty results, meaning he had some dates that didn't work out so well. So what Abad did is he took an open-source spam filter called Spam Assassin and hooked it up to... MySpace, and the way a spam filter works is you train it on incoming email. You say, this is legitimate email, this is spam, and it uses artificial intelligence to try and sort out the difference. So you know at any given moment how close we are to the singularity because of the amount of spam in your inbox, right? When it, artificial intelligence is working, you won't have any more spam in your inbox. So anyway, um, Abad just fed it profiles from MySpace of girls he dated and liked, as legitimate email. Profiles from girls he dated and not liked, fed them in as spam, and then runs it against every profile on MySpace and outspits girls you might like to date, right? 
Now, I don't know what we need Match.com for when we can have spam dating. I think there's like three startups here, but you know, nobody's doing that yet. All right. That's the best picture in the world of ABAD. Okay, I'm gonna walk over here because I have to do some funkiness with my computer here. Um, can we get the audio from the, from the stage here? I just can't resist trying these um, highly Extension tenuous Extension two, zero, okay. one, six, nine. Something's going wrong. I guess I don't have a functional self signal. Okay, we're gonna skip that. Anybody use keys like this? Bleep. Well, kids these days will stroll through a Walmart parking lot clicking open, 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 bloop. Eventually, you find another Jetta or whatever that looks kind of like yours that has the same key code, right? Well, that's because car manufacturers haven't figured out what we think of as some fundamental computer security concepts like key space. It's actually free to have billions and billions of codes, more than you have cars in a system like this. But they don't know about that, so there's like a couple thousand codes, and sometimes they get reused. Anyway, for one manufacturer, we figured out how to manipulate the key so that it will open every car from that manufacturer. <laughs> right? So where's the system update in your car? Your car is now a PC. Your phone is obviously a PC. Your TV is a PC. Your toaster, if it's not yet, will soon be a PC. right? So they inherit the security properties of PCs. And um, in PCs, we have system updates. So when we have this problem, we just update them all and they don't have that problem next week. Well, what are you gonna do? Roll all the cars back into the dealership or something? So for hackers, there's always a playground. There is a point I was actually gonna make about all this and why I'm telling you this stuff, which is that, you know, the reason I'm interested in this stuff is that I think the mindset of a hacker is sort of optimized for discovery. It's a, it's a way of thinking about the world and interacting with a world that's gonna give you something new. And f you're gonna figure out what's possible. So a good example of that I always say is, you know, if you get some new gadget or Ken gets you some new gadget or something, well, you might ask, well, what does this do? And, you know, the answer is always like, it's a phone, duh. And, oh, okay, I got it, it's a phone. But for a computer hacker, the question is gonna be different. The question is, what can I make this do? And if you ask, what can I make this do? That implies a much different interaction. You're gonna take the screws out, pull the back off, find out what's inside, tear it up into pieces, and then figure out what you can build from the rubble. And so this process of technology and, and advancement in technology and science it starts with this discovery process. And unfortunately, most of our computer hackers are busy trying to secure corporate networks and shit instead of working in product development. So uh, someday we'll fix that. Anybody here use a lock like this on your front door? I have one too. They're pretty awesome. They cost $23 at Home Depot. It's a Schlage lock. And can we switch to this mic for a sec? Okay. So. I brought one, this is, a, this is a Schlage lock. Statistically, it's on like half of the front doors in America. Um, what I'm gonna show you works like, you know, on every other lock too. Anybody ever try to pick locks before? Yeah, of course, yeah. Everybody learns to pick locks in elementary school because this is America. Well, um, it's tedious, you kind of need OCD. You stick those tools in there, you finick with them and you know, work out in the finesse and eventually get open. Well, um, I was never very good at that. So this lock, I have a key for it that I made, which is a Schlage key, so it fits in the lock, but it doesn't turn it because it's not cut properly, right? I've actually just cut all the teeth to the lowest settings. What it allows me to do is I pop that key in there, smack it a few times, and we're in. I just picked this lock. It's really freaking easy. I mean, I don't know much about this that you don't at this point. Uh, you know, kids, if you look on YouTube, there's 11 year old girls who will show you how to do it. Um, and just for fun, I bought a key machine so I could make these keys. 
And um, you know, while I was at it, I had my interns make one for all of you guys. So if you want to try this, come see me afterwards, and I'll give you what it's called a bump key, and you can try learning to pick locks. Glad you like that. You can see here I made a key ring with all the other kinds of locks in America. So I have a, I have a bump key for every lock. Anybody use these USB thumb drives? Print my Word document for me kind of thing? Well, mine is kind of like yours. I can use it for you to print my Word document. But while you're doing it, you know, for convenience, in the background, invisibly, magically, it's making a little handy backup of your My Documents folder and your registry and your password database and your browser cookies and all that. Just in case you ever need it, you know, come see me. We like to just give these away at conferences, you know. If you're at a trade show and you find one for free, um, maybe it's a deluxe one. Oh, okay, anybody here use credit cards? Oh, yeah, they've gotten wildly popular, haven't they? Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. Okay, I'm going to put this mic down and I'm going to finick with another, uh, you know, demo, which probably will fail. I need the, this mic again. So here's the thing. Credit cards, as you know, obviously are wildly insecure. Hackers steal them from websites and go shopping on victoriasecret.com all the time. Um, and the credit card industry has always said, oh, well, you know, that's not really a problem. Don't worry about it. Just go shopping. And, um, you know, what we think about that is that they're lying and it is a problem. But whatever. Here's what we did. We got a new credit card in the mail, um, which came with a letter explaining how it was our new secure credit card. Did anybody get one of these? Yeah. And they know it's secure because that's a computer chip in it. And um, the computer chip is an RFID chip, which means that instead of actually having to swipe your card through a reader, all you got to do is kind of get near the reader with your card. And they have these readers in Starbucks and uh, taxi cabs in New York and whatnot. So anyway, um, whenever I get something in the mail, it says it's secure. <laughs> so we started buying RFID gear on, e on, on the internet. And one of the things we bought was this, this reader on eBay um, for $8 which is just like the one at Starbucks. Anybody want to show me their awesome new secure credit card? <laughs> Sammy, come show me your credit card. <laughs> that would actually be pretty awesome. You should bring it up here. Uh, OK, I, I just need a volunteer with a credit card. Come on. So, well, let's use peer pressure. Come on, get Sammy or somebody to come over. <laughs> We're not filming, are we? No, just stick it in your back pocket. Yeah, oh, uh, that works, yeah. Put it in your pocket. The back pocket. It's better in the back pocket. Okay, come over here. I just want to show you. We're gonna we're gonna scan. Do they want to see my rear? Yeah, yeah, they totally do. Okay. Uh, okay. I know this is the coolest. Uh... Yeah. Okay. So here we go. This is. I mean, nobody else is gonna show code on screen. So I'm gonna scan Sammy's ass. Can someone call my visa <laughs> yeah, call. company right now and just shut this off? I'm doing that too. Beep. Did you hear the beep? That beep means a hacker is scanning your ass. And there's, oh, valued card holder. It doesn't have his name. OK, you're done. Thanks. So we got Sammy's credit card number and expiration date. And all I had to do was get near his ass with my reader. And it beeps. So you know it's secure because if there's a problem, it'll beep. I, I don't know. Anyway, so it turned out this wasn't actually, I mean, we were tooling up to crack the crypto. And we thought that you know it was going to be hard hacking. It was actually embarrassingly easy hacking. Um, that's, uh, that, that slide is still in there, okay. <laughs> All right, so there's a point to this. I'm going to try and, uh, how much time do I have? Like a minute? Um, so this is a protocol diagram for SSL, which probably nobody except for Sammy has ever contemplated before. You don't have to here. There's no point in this slide other than to say that this is a complex crypto system that's built into your web browser. And what it does is, where's my other mic? Um, and what it does is encrypt your credit card number when you send it over the intertube to Amazon or Victoria's Secret. Well, what a hacker will do is attack this protocol at every point along the way. 
We'll send two responses where it was expecting one to the server. We'll put a zero in where there was supposed to be a one. We'll send twice as much data as we were supposed to. We'll take twice as long as we were supposed to sending a response. All these kinds of things. Just random shit. We'll just make shit up in our sleep. And then we'll try it, see what falls in our lap, right? See what breaks. And from that, figure out what's possible. This is more what SSL might look like to a hacker. This is um, maybe the wrong presentation. This guy kills a million people in Africa every year. It's an Ophelis defensi mosquito carrying malaria. Well, what's, how's that related again? Um, oh yeah, because this is a protocol diagram for malaria. So it has a complex life cycle. It spends a little bit of time in humans and a little bit of time in mosquitoes. The malaria parasite does. But what we want to do in the lab where I work is attack this protocol at every point. And this is why I hire hackers in the lab. I want to find out how I'm going to eradicate malaria. And I'm going to find out by attacking everything along the way. So we've come up with some crazy ideas along the way. The old fashioned way of attacking malaria was with chemicals, spray chemicals. This is an actual ad from like the 40s, the DDT song. And, um, you know, it's politically not too popular. So our idea was hey, let's go after those mosquitoes and shoot them down with laser beams. Um, which sounds like a ridiculous idea. And, you know, we all kind of laughed about it for a while. But then we built it. So the idea is you would put lasers on fence posts around a building or a village and it would just shoot all the mosquitoes on their way into to the humans. You might want this for your backyard. Uh, we eventually figured out we might be able to protect crops from pests that way. But this is the sort of thing that's made possible again by Moore's Law, right? It's made of consumer electronics. So um, it's pretty easy if you give it time to calculate with a computer the value of the life of every individual bug before you shoot it down. So what we do is in our lab um, we use a video camera essentially to find moving stuff. If something is moving we aim a laser at it and we use that to sample its wing beat frequency. And from that we can tell hey this is a mosquito and it's female. And then we shoot it down with a lethal laser. <laughs> it's good fun stuff. <laughs> um, and so far, nobody has come to the rescue of the mosquitoes. So that system's, uh, you know, that's like live video of, uh, of the system working. And um, we do a lot of experiments in the lab to try and understand our enemy, in this case, malaria, um, and by extension, mosquitoes. So you can see we've been doing high-speed video. Here I've just lit up a mosquito with a UV laser, burnt off his wing, and he's not coming back. There's another one, UV laser vaporized his wing. This is just fun, you know. <laughs> Who likes mosquitoes? <laughs> oh, nobody. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, this is kind of before we had tuned the lasers properly and we just kind of vaporized the whole mosquito. <laughs> but it's, it's sort of satisfying, huh? <laughs> Smells great, too. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so this is all done at the Intellectual Ventures Lab. Um, we basically put one of every kind of scientist in the building with every tool in the world and we work on inventing solutions to some of humanity's hardest problems and um, and most of the time where we find those is at the intersection of different areas in science and technology right so lasers for mosquitoes might not be something you'd come up with somewhere else but in a place like this uh, we're doing it all the time um, this is a project I worked on to figure out how to suppress hurricanes. I think we're running low on time, so I'm going to zip through this. Uh, but basically, it's a giant tube. You stick it in the ocean, and it cools off the surface of the ocean enough to maybe uh, keep hurricanes from being so intensive. Right? We have no investor in that. We just did it because we thought it was cool. And um, what it needs is more research to figure out uh, um, the effects and where to put them and how big to make them and all that kind of stuff. It's a big project. You'd put thousands of these things in the Gulf, but our design is made of recycled truck tires. It's just a big tube, and it uses wave power to create a pumping effect that pushes the hot water down. But, you know, 
This could maybe turn cat fives into cat fours or cat fours into cat threes. And it would certainly cost a lot less than the damage from a hurricane. So some big ideas. This is a idea we had for figuring out how to reverse the effects of global warming. So uh, this is a nozzle spitting out SO2 in the stratosphere. It gets it there by hauling a big hose up 12 miles into the sky on helium balloons. Those triangular things are helium balloons. And the idea is that this little white particulate goes out uh, in the stratosphere and reflects about 1% of sunlight, just a little bit of sunlight, just enough to keep uh, the Earth from getting heated up. Right? We think one of these things in the Arctic could reverse uh, ice conditions back to pre-industrial levels, right? And it costs, we don't know, but it's like tens of millions of dollars to do. It's actually pretty cheap. It's not billions or trillions. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about today is um, this other problem humans have, which are these stainless steel casks, um, which contain depleted uranium from today's reactors. What we do is we dig uranium out of the ground. We put that through an enrichment process where we get about 1% of the energy out. And uh, the other 99% is sitting in these stainless steel casks on the surface of the earth. We don't really have a plan for what to do with it. Here's a photo of a stockpile in Kentucky of 700,000 metric tons of depleted uranium we don't have a plan for. Um, and so this caused lots of problems, you know, lots of radiation, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's a mess. So we decided to figure out how to build a reactor that can be powered by nuclear waste. And we now have uh, what I think is the world's largest advanced reactor design group. It's about 40 people, which kind of shows you nobody else is trying. We haven't had a new reactor technology in 30 years. This is the first one. And so um, the way it works is you, oh, I'm, I'm not gonna show the video, I guess, but anyway, the way it works is kind of like a candle. You light it up at one end, it burns from one end to the other over the course of about 60 years. There's no moving parts. It stays underground. We load it up with depleted uranium, and what happens is the fuel gets enriched right inside the reactor, and then a second wave burns the fuel right inside the reactor, so you don't have a reactor loaded with fissionable material like today's reactors. So anyway, we're working on that, and, and a bunch of other crazy projects, and I'm happy to, I'll be around all day, so if anyone's interested, come see me, and we'll chat more, and I'll give you bump keys.